All right, here we go. Rachel Carpenter of Intrinio. Thank you so much for joining me here on the She Conquers Capital podcast. Thank you. It's great to be here. I know I've had the pleasure of seeing you speak and, and really just enjoying your energy and your story, but for our listeners and viewers, just to give us a background on who you are and what Intrinio is all about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I am the founder and CEO of a financial technology company called Intrinio. I've had quite a journey to get here. Um, I grew up in Wisconsin and studied finance and management in college. Uh, graduated and my co-founder and I actually taught ourselves how to program, which was quite a journey. So marrying kind of the, the financial background from school with my own self-taught development skills. Um, and we actually launched what we thought was going to be our business in about 2012, um, kind of a financial analysis website online. Um, unfortunately, recognized throughout that process that most financial apps and tools require data. Data is kind of the raw materials that make the financial industry flow. Um, and when we went shopping to try to buy the data that we needed for this dream we had, this website we were building, it came back at a price between sixty and seventy thousand dollars a month. So, as a former founder and entrepreneur, I'm sure you can understand that an expense like that can stop you dead in your tracks pretty quickly. Um, so I was fresh out of college. I had just taught myself how to program. I was excited, ready to go, and I was just completely stopped dead in my tracks. And the analogy that I use when I explain kind of the origins of Intrinio is that it felt like building a car and then not being able to afford to put gas inside of it. Yeah. So you're just sitting there and looking at it and it's extremely frustrating. But um, I think that a lot of times extreme frustration and anger can be a great motivator. Um, so we massively pivoted and started to look at the data industry um, that kind of supports the entire financial industry. So the plumbers behind the scenes, where does the intelligence, where does the data come from? Um, and we learned a lot. We learned that there's five companies that have a complete stronghold on the data industry. And if anybody in financial services wants to get access, they're going to have to pay a lot of money. Um, and so we made it our mission at that point in time to re-architect the financial data supply chain and build a platform that made that those raw data streams and that intelligence available to anybody that wanted to innovate in financial services. And so we started by selling data feeds to people that are really mobile apps to look at your stock portfolio. So if you were sifting through, you know, a mobile app looking at stocks, the stock prices might have been coming from Intrinio. Um, other entrepreneurs that were building artificial intelligence bots for investing or websites, different tools like that. And we were kind of the plumbers behind the scenes that were delivering all the data to those innovators. And over the past couple of years, um, obviously innovation has also hit the institutional side of the financial mm -hmm. industry. So a lot of larger asset managers and banks are also looking for more affordable, modern ways to digest data. And so we started to bring on a lot more institutional clients and expand in that direction as well. So today we have a team of 25 brilliant, nerdy engineers and salespeople and they're a fantastic uh, team to work with. Um, we have two offices. We're down in St. Petersburg, Florida, and also in Colorado Springs. And we've got over 300 different types of data on the platform and over a thousand customers and we're growing and it's been a fun journey. What I love is that usually founders, you know, especially you know, for fintech, you usually have someone who's either has the expertise on the financial side um, or the technology side, but it sounds like you got them both. You are the fintech um, <laughs> as far as like your background. Yeah, I'm, I'm a huge fan of the book uh, Zero to One by Peter Thiel, if you've read it. Um, and my tech, the tech side of my fintech skills got us from zero to one. Um, but I quickly realized as a self-taught engineer, I didn't have the, the scale of skills sure. really um, to blow it out of the water for the team. And so I hired a bunch of great CTO and some engineers. And I'm so grateful that I have that background because it allows me to like really understand our engineers and what they're going through. Um, but I hired some experts and they kicked me out of the code base pretty quickly. <laughs> but it is important in the, in the early days as you're getting your first lines of code built and your platform off the ground. Um, it, it was really helpful to have both of those skill sets. And I think it still serves me today to have that background. Sure, I always say learn at least enough to be dangerous. Yes. <laughs> and, and it seems like that's really where the inspiration, you know, was born. It was your, the depth of knowledge of the finance industry and the understanding of the data that drives it yep. that really allowed you to see the opportunity. Yeah, exactly. 
So at that point, once you identified this, you know, this opportunity and you had the idea and you really wanted to run with it, in that moment, what was your understanding of the entrepreneurial space? Had you truly set out to be a startup founder? Was that your goal? What, you know, what was your, talk to us about that time in the, in the journey. Heck no. I did not know what I was doing. <laughs> well, we all, um, none of us know what we're doing. <laughs> I didn't have visions of, of being an entrepreneur in my head. I just was angry about how inaccessible the data was. And, and for almost two years, as we built our technology, we just dove into that, which is a good and a bad thing um, because I came out the other end of building our technology, needing to raise capital without, I mean, I wasn't, I didn't know anything about entrepreneurship. And um, in a good and a bad way, I learned as I went and I made a lot of mistakes. Um, but I'm a fast learner and I like to be thrown into the fire. That's the way that I <laughs> learn best. So um, we had a, a year or two where we were really building our technology, came out the other end of that and went, oh, we have to raise money and we have to hire a team. What, you know, we need an advisory board and all of these things we just kind of learned as we went. Um, so that's, it was kind of trial by fire for us. Um, there was a lot of technology we needed to build in the beginning. And so I think that definitely played a hand in that. So when you realized that you had to raise capital, describe what you thought that process was initially and maybe how that perception evolved as you got deeper into the process. Yeah. Um, I think I learned a lot of lessons during that time period. I think I thought it was a lot more formal than it really turned out to be. Um, you know, the pitch deck meant everything. It had to be perfect. And I was probably going to bigger investment firms instead of angels early on. And so I assumed it was a lot more formal, serious, go reach out to an institution, they'll give you money. Um, when in fact, it was all about building relationships, especially the early, early times, finding angels that understood our industry and were willing to support us early on. Um, that was one of the big lessons I learned is that the pitch set doesn't actually matter. Even when I raised my series A round that I closed in April of 2019, I think I presented my pitch deck formally maybe twice and I talked to a hundred investors. And so much more about telling your story, human to human, building a relationship and being able to speak to it instead of formally present it. Um, that was one of the big lessons that I learned. And what about building relationships? How did, you know, how did that evolve for you? Especially some of these relationships, maybe, maybe you had an existing relationship going into it, which allowed the conversation to start at a different, at a different point. Um, but I'm sure a lot of these were, you know, initial just getting to know you meetings and there was obviously you know an outcome that you were looking for so how how were you able to nurture those relationships especially in a way that felt really authentic to you in the process yeah um so i think there's kind of two pieces to this the first piece is that i wasted a lot of time trying to build those relationships and, and authentically tell my story with people who did not understand the industry that we were operating in. The problem with FinTech is that you have a lot of money in that industry coming from old school Wall Street types that don't necessarily understand technology. I mean, that was the, that's the problem. That's why we need FinTech in the first place is that they're lacking all of the technology. Mm -hmm. um, so having a company that's a developer first API data and infrastructure business for the financial services industry is very niche. And there's a lot of fintech VCs out there that are into payments and lending and consumer banking and not back-end unsexy plumbing and infrastructure. Um, and it's a very small niche, so, mm -hmm. so knowing who to reach out to and, and not wasting your time trying to build relationships, learning that you can actually say no to an investor as well if they're not the right fit for you. I, I'm very fierce and diligent, and so I would pound down doors even though they were a dead end for me and not realizing this person doesn't understand infrastructure. Um, so that was one big lesson I learned. And the fact that I didn't know what I was doing and was reaching out to firms that were way too big, way growth stage VCs and things like that at the time, actually paid off for me because I did still approach those conversations from a very authentic place, having spent the time to build a quality product solving a real problem. And so even though I, the, the investors I was speaking to that we were too early for their mandate, they still liked me and believed in me and wanted to introduce me to a lot of their friends who were running early stage VCs. That's actually how we got introduced to the lead for our Series A investment is that 
I reached out to somebody that was a firm that was way too growth stage for us, mm -hmm. but he actually wanted to buy our data. He understood the product and then made an introduction to an earlier stage VC that ended up leading our series A round. So no matter what you do, approaching it authentically is important because people will pay it forward for you in this industry. Um, but also knowing when you need to say no to is very important. Right. Yeah. And letting those conversations not not drag on so you can use your time efficiently was um, it's always fascinating to me is, you know, the the metrics that catch an investor's attention, because it's not always what you think, you know, as you're telling your story, the, the, the big value that you see isn't always what people grab onto on the other side of the table. Right. Um, do you have an example of, you know, some, uh, where, you know, someone just really, I don't know, just put all of their attention on something that you were like, Oh, that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a couple. So, hesitate to say this because I know that the, the venture industry is moving a lot more towards revenue and not towards users. It's starting to crack down. It used to be, if you have a million users, we'll give you $10 million mm -hmm. and it doesn't, we don't care what your revenue is at. I think people are starting to wise up to that and revenue is important. So I want to caveat this answer with that, but I put a lot of pressure on myself to say, I don't want to reach out until I'm at the goalpost of revenue that they think we need to be at. Um, but then I would have conversations with investors who would say, you have 300 FinTech companies that are using your data right now. And I'm just disregarding it because they're small FinTech companies and mm -hmm. they're saying those companies will grow, become enterprise customers. That's really impressive. Um, so, so, so in that sense, they were excited about the user base and the fact that we were naturally organically from an inbound perspective, capturing hundreds of FinTech companies um, and also our technology. So for the investors that really understood what we were doing, they would say, you built a machine learning engine to automatically normalize every single 10K and 10Q from the SEC database with two people. And we were like, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> so, um, you know, we were moving fast building technology and I think the user base and some of the technology we built that definitely caught the eye of some investors. Um, and so the caveat to that though, is that the dynamic is changing and they are starting to care a lot more about revenue now than, than users and, and product. Sure. I love um, just to kind of dig a little bit deeper into something you said about, you know, only two people have done all of this. I think that there's, you know, they say a lot that they don't necessarily bet on the horse, they bet on the jockey. And, and I think that there's an element of, you know, you're, you're telling the story of what you are building, what you have created out there in the marketplace, but don't disregard the, the value in how you've done it because there is a lot. It says a lot about how you will move forward, how you will confront challenges in the future, your wherewithal to do that. And, um, and there's just a lot, you know, in that. So don't be afraid to tell the story of how you got here because people will really grab onto that. Yeah. Um, I read somewhere in the Twitter sphere recently, somebody said, uh, when I'm evaluating a company and in due diligence, I asked myself, if I was in this industry, would I be terrified to compete against the CEO? <laughs> Which That's is a, a great point. point right? Yeah. You ask yourself that question. Um, and part of it is, you know, being competitive and, and the kind of person who's going to win no matter what. Part of it is also just being passionate as well, which I think in the early days, that's kind of all you have to ride on. If you're raising money from angel investors, you don't, might not have your technology built, you might not have any revenue. So can you tell the story clearly and can you be passionate about it? If you're not passionate about it, they will know. <laughs> they will know immediately. Um, and then what's to say that you're not gonna lose in interest as, as the leader and this person steering the ship later on down the road. So absolutely, it's the jockey, not the horse, and especially in early stage fundraising, that is very important. So 2019, you closed your Series A. Yes. Yes. Uh, $5 million round. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, what, if you had one piece of advice for someone who is raising a similar round of capital or a big lesson learned from that entire experience, what would it be? Oh my goodness. Um, that's a good question. I think that, uh, Timing is very important. Um, so planning out your runway um, and knowing that it's going to take longer than you think. Um, I think I had having raised money from angel investors and some small re seed rounds previously. 
I was unprepared for the degree of diligence. I was unprepared for the lawyers to sift through all of our contracts and all of the above. And so um, planning out your runway, knowing when the right time to fundraise is, so you're not putting yourself in a, in a bad position, that was important. Um, and the other one too, I think, um, and this is a, a lesson that I learned from actually going through uh, the Village Capital Program. I'm not sure if you're familiar with them. They do a kind of a growth uh, fundraising uh, program. And as we watched companies go through this program, they could sell their product and their technology and everything else. And then when it got to the numbers, everyone tanked. And it was oh. so easy to just pick people's models apart. And there were people who were just hockey sticking up their revenue with no assumptions built into the model. And so it's a common problem for founders to not necessarily, we're not accountants, most of us, right? And so having a really strong financial narrative was the most important thing I learned out of that program. So you need to know the numbers, but you have to weave the numbers into a financial narrative that explains how you're going to grow. And most founders don't think of that. What are your unit economics? What are your growth drivers? Speaking intelligently to those in a vocal narrative way, it will impress investors so much because most founders can't talk about that. Um, so that was really important, um, mostly in the numbers piece. Knowing how to, how to derive a financial narrative and also speaking in probabilities is very important too. Um, they're gonna cut your numbers in half. They're not gonna believe your projections. If we knew what the future held, we'd all be billionaires, right? So um, having a you know, high, like great case, a medium case and a base case for what you think your numbers are gonna grow because it's out of your hands to show that you're being realistic and you're planning for the future is important as well. So I think the numbers, the timing and the numbers those are two areas that a lot of entrepreneurs don't focus on, but they make a big difference. Well, and I'm sure your finance background really, really helped in that in that area. And I think something that's important too, you know, having screened uh, deals for for investors. I know from my side, yes, the numbers tell a story, and so you know what aspects of your numbers really strengthen the foundation of the opportunity. But maybe there's something in there. Maybe there was a bad couple months in there, or there were a lot of returns, you know, you know what numbers you're maybe scared to show. And so, but being ready to talk about that, you know, because they will find it. Um, and then also I have seen, you know, where I feel like founders are, um, presenting numbers in a way that tries to hide. Um, and that's another, that's another thing that, you know, just be honest and then ready to share. Mm -hmm. um, it's an important, I think, just value, you know, to just yeah. stand behind it. No one is expecting you to be perfect. We're learning all along the way. Okay, so you tried something, it maybe didn't have a great outcome, and then how did you bounce back? That story tells me a lot about who you are and how you'll grow. So I'm um, really standing behind whatever narrative is there to present is really important. Totally agree. Um, being honest, no one wants to invest in, it's a marriage, right? So no one wants to invest in somebody that's going to continue, that's going to lie to them. And on top of that, they're going to get a copy of your model anyway. <laughs> You've likely got really smart analysts that are going to tear it apart and find what you're hiding. So I agree. It's just never worth it. You mentioned timing. How long did it take you to close that series A round? Um, from my early conversations to when the round actually closed, almost six months. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's pretty good. For that six months, you're still running your company <laughs> and you're raising capital. Talk about balancing, you know, and, and, and what that was like when you have this really big undertaking of this capital raise. Well, you sure as heck better hope you have a stellar team because they carried me through that. And that was huge. Um, in a startup, it's very important to hire people that don't need to be micromanaged, um, self-starters. And if the, if the goals are made very clear and you tell people what they need to do and not how, then they're free to go and do it, um, which requires so much less management. So I do have to give hats off to my team because they're so self-motivated and they work together and they are the reason that I was able to spend so much time on fundraising. Um, the other reason as well, as well um, is that I have a, a chief operating officer, which is not very common in startups, but it's becoming a big trend right now, actually. Um, in the VC sphere, they're talking about this, the chief of staff is actually now a trending position at startups. And so having someone fill that role for me, 
I could be out working on the big picture things, coming back in to check in. Well, from an operational perspective, the ship is still floating. Um, that was invaluable to me as well. So whether it's a COO or a chief of staff, somebody at the home front that you can trust that has a very operational, organized mindset. I'm the crazy founder CEO, right? I am wildly unorganized and very much a big picture thinker. So um, having that combination is really helpful and just having a great team because you're absolutely right. It's I had a, a friend who's an entrepreneur recently asked me, so I'm planning a raise and I'm marking down about like 20% of my time to be focused on that. And I just laughed and I went, try, try 90, if not 95, because it's yeah. a, huge, a huge timing thing. So, But I would venture to say that because you were able to give so much attention to it, knowing that things are taken care of on the home front, I believe that six months was, was a product of that that, you know, you were able to get the job done and then, and then come back. Yeah. Um, I would love to talk about, you have this infusion of capital. You have, you know, you have said, I'm sure dozens, if not hundreds of times, exactly how you intend to use those funds for the growth. What's it like finishing the, finishing the round and you have these resources and now it's time to implement. And what have you learned in that process? Yeah, um, things change a lot at startups, they're very fast. Um, so that's a piece of it is, is remaining open to the fact that the plan might change rapidly. Um, for us, we built a product that solved a huge problem and the target market was a very technical developer user base. They're on the internet searching for what they need. So we really quickly grew to be a series A size company um, just from inbound customer acquisition. Digital marketing, SEO, we didn't even hardly spend any money on PPC. And we knew heading into the series A that that was lucky, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that doesn't scale forever. Um, and so it's great and if it's not broken, don't fix it. Um, but we needed to build an outbound strategy on top of that and fill in some of the staff um, that are on the sales and marketing front to really expand customer acquisition. So continuing to put capital into that inbound approach, I mean, it's great if customers are coming to you, um, but now we need to really expand and go out and reach the customers as well. So um, from a hiring perspective, obviously engineers um, and really investing in that sales and marketing team to add an outbound approach on top of it was, was important for us. Um, and also we're a data company, so more data, right? Yeah. <laughs> So we're, uh, we've been planning on building a couple of different innovative tools that we're actually in development of right now um, to help us source data and, and become a hub for data a lot faster. Um, sometimes we're sourcing data from third parties that want to be part of our network. And sometimes we're actually building the data sets on our own, which is fun. Um, so adding to our product and our features um, from that perspective, and then also um, staffing up on the team side, and getting ready to spend money on marketing for the first time, which is, when I say for the first time, I mean mm -hmm. actually like, deploying capital through new channels for outbound um, and being very data-driven and metrics-driven on that too. Um, so all of those things are in motion right now, um, but having a strong plan and knowing heading into it how you're gonna use your funds is, is important, so. And you mentioned earlier, you know, about bringing on your advisory board, how, you know, maybe share a little bit about that group and how they've supported you with all of this fast moving change. Yeah. Um, so I'm the first to admit that we have a very young technical team, um, brilliant, brilliant engineers, data scientists, um, but we're young, right? And I'm not an ageist. I'm, I'm, I just turned 30. Um, but I also know that we're disrupting an industry that is very traditional. And nobody on our team has worked in financial services for, you know, 10 plus years. Mm -hmm. um, and so the caveat is that I'm happy that that's the kind of team we have because to bring disruption to an industry like that, you have to be different. Um, but we need that kind of tap on the shoulder. And that's where the advisory board comes in is hiring people that actually have institutional experience and can be a gut check for us as we're saying, bringing this crazy innovation to the industry. Um, so I got very lucky. The thing about Florida is that a lot of Wall Street executives retire down here. Sure. <laughs> we have if not, at least they visit, yeah. Incentives. Um, and so we actually ended up meeting the former global head of equity research at Goldman Sachs, the former global head of equity research at JP Morgan, um, one of the founders of Thomson Financial, which became Thomson Reuters, a major data company. I mean, the, the caliber of our advisors is, is really incredible. Um, and they can bring that experience and perspective that us cra crazy 
development hooligans need a little bit of a gut check on. Um, and so I'm, I'm the first to admit that I, I needed to surround myself with people who really knew old school finance um, well. And so that's how we that's how we built the advisory board and they have been just invaluable to us. I love it. And do you have a mentee or more multiple that you are helping um, who may be a few steps behind you as well? Yeah, I have a lot of women that reach out to me. There's not a lot of women in uh, financial services or technology or the intersection of those two. Um, and so I regularly meet, meet for coffee. I give a lot of speeches and sit on panels and stuff locally. Um, I don't have anybody specifically that I'm mentoring, um, but it just, it comes in droves from, from women that reach out and, and want to, to talk to me about their journeys. So um, I was grateful to have a lot of mentors as I was getting to where I'm at today. So I am the first to say I want to give back as well. The only part of the only reason I've been able to get to where I've been is that other women and, and men, I think, I think it's very important to also bring that perspective in too, mm -hmm. um, who have guided me along the way. So it's very important to give back and I, I definitely make time for that. Beautiful. So what do the next, you know, what is this, what does the next year hold for you? So we are continuing to expand the team, add data sets, um, and we're actually in development of an enterprise version of Intrinio, um, which is huge. Uh, data management at financial institutions, um, their ability to source data um, effectively and fast is increasingly the way that they're gonna compete. Hedge funds, quant funds, everything's data driven now. Um, the amount of new data sets that come out every minute is absolutely just astounding. Um, and so harnessing all of that into actionable intelligence fast and effectively, it's kind of what Intrinio is good at. Um, and so we're actually in development of uh, a solution um, for enterprises as well for data management. And so that's coming soon. Um, that's one of the big things we're working on this year and just continuing to scale and, and grow our amazing team. I love it. If someone wants to follow you, learn more about Intrinio, where should they go? So you can follow me on Twitter. Um, it's Rachel underscore Ann with two N's and then underscore C. You can also go to our website, www.intrinio.com. We have an amazing group of uh, team members that are on instant chat support and just tell them you want to talk to me and they'll, uh, they'll hook you up with me. Rachel, I really appreciate you sharing your journey here. Um, I love just the evolution um, and all of the advice that you've shared because it's really, really important. And um, yeah, thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, this was fun. Thanks for having me.